A special case of the intermediate value theorem is when the particular y value that we care about happens to be k equals 0. See, k equals 0, or the y value equal to 0, would be the x-axis. And so for the intermediate value theorem, the question we would really be asking uh, that would correspond to the k equals 0 case would be, what are the roots of a function? And see, finding roots of a function is a really important question uh, an important aspect of um, being able to figure out what the function looks like. And this is actually not a super easy task. I mean, if a polynomial is easily factorable, then we can um, get those roots from the factors. But in general, we may not have a polynomial. There are plenty of other functions that don't behave nearly as nicely as that. And so finding roots of even polynomials that don't factor nicely is a difficult task. And so sometimes we need to be able to uh, utilize something like the intermediate value theorem to help us approximate roots, help us narrow down the interval for which we can guarantee a root exists. If that interval is small enough, perhaps we are precise enough with what the root could be. And so this uh, finding roots is, a, is certainly an important but very difficult task in general. So one thing I wanted to point out to you here related to this is in the special case whenever k is equal to 0, remember that k value has to be in between the two function values. And so what it really amounts to is when we are looking at a particular interval a, b, and we compute both um, f of a and f of b, if we notice that these have opposite signs, Um, one's positive and one's negative, we have no choice for that continuous function to cross over the x-axis somewhere between a and b. Um, whether it goes from above to below or below to above has to do with what's happening at the endpoints of the interval. But um, just noting that we have opposite signs has that k equals zero in between the function values. And so um, one other thing that comes up with the intermediate value theorem that we don't even realize perhaps that we're utilizing the intermediate value theorem is when we're solving nonlinear inequalities. We use the intermediate value theorem to really dictate our process here. Um, because what happens when we're solving these um, nonlinear inequalities, we identify all of the roots and we identify all of the discontinuities. And so if we list out all of the roots and we list out all of the discontinuities, the intermediate value theorem is going to tell us that um, between all of the roots and discontinuities, our function either is entirely positive or entirely negative uh, between these roots and discontinuities. So I'll say on intervals, uh, given by the roots and discontinuities. And to remind you of kind of the process of solving a nonlinear inequality, um, we're going to do that here because it comes directly from the intermediate value theorem. And this is a concept that we're going to have to do repeatedly towards the end um, of our differential calculus as we're trying to do some curve sketching. And so this key um, task of being able to solve a nonlinear inequality is a really critical task for calculus, even though it, it itself is, a, is an algebraic task. So here for this example, we have a rational function. It's already factored nicely for us. Um, the top is factored. The bottom just has a single linear factor. And so what we see is we get the roots uh, wherever the top is equal to zero. That would be where the function is equal to zero is where the top is equal to zero. So we get those roots by setting the factors from the top equal to zero. And when we do, we get the, the roots x equals negative four and x equals one. Uh, the other thing we do is we look at the discontinuities. And the discontinuities for a rational function would be wherever the bottom is equal to zero because we cannot divide by zero. Um, those values would be removed from the domain. It would be a discontinuity. So we set the bottom equal to zero and solve. Uh, we do that by subtracting over the three, dividing by two, leaving us with x equals negative three halves. 
So those three x values are all of the roots and the discontinuities for our function f of x. And so the way that I uh, typically teach this, I mean, you can put this information kind of on a chart or a number line. I tend to put it on a number line as a better visual moving forward, um, but chart could work as well. Um, this number line, we're talking about um, values where the function is zero or discontinuous being the important values that land on the number line, and you certainly want to have them in the right order. So we have negative four, negative three halves, and one being our three key places. Now that actually splits up this, um, this number line into four intervals. Um, in each interval, we need to assess what the sign is. And we don't actually care about what the value of each sign is. We just care about the sign of the interval. Uh, we don't care about the actual function value. And so what I do is I go ahead and just think about test points in between, perhaps. You don't even need these exact values, but sometimes it helps me have kind of a concrete test value. And I put that in parentheses because I'm just picking a random value less than negative four for that interval. Between negative four and negative three halves, perhaps I would maybe even think about what negative two would be in there. Um, zero would be one that's between negative three halves and one, and then perhaps two, which would be to the right of one. I put those in parentheses. They're not critical values. They just sometimes help me kind of think about what's happening. Um, as I'm looking at this, um, I know that my function f of x has three factors, two on the top, one on the bottom. So um, if I'm thinking about my test value of negative 5, if I plug in that negative 5 to the first factor on top, I have negative 5 plus 4. Negative 5 plus 4 is negative for that factor. I move on to the next factor on top. It would be negative 5 minus 1. That would be negative 6, so that again would be a negative factor. Pushing down to the bottom using that test value of negative five, we'd have two times negative five would be negative 10 plus three is still negative for the negative seven. So overall, I have two negative factors on top, a negative factor on bottom. That's an odd number of negatives. That's going to be negative overall because it would really be like a positive over a negative. Okay, and then we just repeat this process for each interval. Now, another thing you could do that was really kind of a, a smart thing to do is realize that um, the only place any individual factor could switch from negative to positive would be at the corresponding root for that factor. And so, for instance, here at negative 4, notice the factor to, or the interval to the left is going to have negative for that factor. But after that, any test value you plug in, so for instance, negative 2, that Plugging negative 2 into that first factor on top would be negative 2 plus 4. That switches it to positive. And then the bigger the value you test in, um, the better off you are there. So that first factor on top is going to be positive everywhere to the right of negative 4. Uh, likewise, that next um, place that's on our number line is negative 3 halves. And we saw that to the far left of uh, negative 3 halves, we were in the negative realm. Well, we continue on into the negative realm. For instance, if we took the test value negative 2 and plugged it into the bottom, we would still have negative 1 in the bottom. But then as soon as we cross over that corresponding fact or that corresponding root for the denominator, um, and perhaps in that interval where we have test value of 0, plugging that that in now is going to make it positive. And we can do the same thing for our last root there of 1. Um, test values to the left of 1 mean that if we subtract 1 from that factor there, the, the test value minus 1, we're going to land in the negative realm of things. But then as soon as we start with a value bigger than 1, subtracting 1 keeps it in the positive realm. So however you want to propagate those, um, those intervals with signs there, I don't recommend getting actual values because you're going to be doing this computation in your head. And each one of these signs is just a quick computation in your head where we don't actually care about the value. So looking at the signs, uh, this second interval that we're looking at has a plus times a minus on top, which would be negative on top. Negative over negative would be positive. Uh, the next one only has a single negative sign overall, so we get negative. And then the last interval, only positive, so we would get positive. And so those signs are telling us ultimately our answer. So our function is positive on the intervals with the plus sign, so it would be negative 4 to negative 3 halves. Notice my test values don't come into play at all in my final answer. That's why I put them in parentheses, so I don't get distracted by them. So we'd have positive on that interval as well as the interval 1 to infinity. 
and then we'd have negative on uh, the interval negative infinity to negative 4. And then we pick back up at negative for negative 3 halves to 1. And so that would be our final answer. And that is simply an algebraic uh, question that we're answering where we're solving a nonlinear inequality, really. But to be able to solve that nonlinear inequality, we're relying heavily on the intermediate value theorem that is telling us that the only possible places to switch from positive to negative or vice versa would be at roots um, or zeros, if you want to call it that or at places of discontinuity. And so uh, those are the places we stuck on our number line. We tested everything in between to get our answers.